Good morning. My privilege to be here with you this morning. Before we begin, I did want to make mention, Chris asked me to make mention of Brother Jim Tomlin. The last report was in the hospital at Grady, and we certainly want to remember Jim and Elise and uh, Jim and his uh, time of difficulty. Uh, I met, first met Brother Jim Tomlin in about 1980 when I was a camper at Camp Nagehi. I remember at least one uh, Comanche cabin Bible study uh, with he and a man named Frank Wheeler that was instrumental in my eventual conversion. Uh, Brother Jim's uh, very precious to me and I know to you as well, so we want to certainly remember Jim and we will have more details on his condition uh, later. This morning we're going to talk about something that became part of the consciousness of our culture uh, only recently, uh, at least in the way it's currently defined, uh, became something that I was aware of just a few years ago and started hearing this term, uh, fear of missing out, fear of missing out. Now I started thinking about that recently and thinking about potential spiritual applications to this uh, cultural phenomenon and that's what I want us to consider this morning. Uh, the concept of f FOMO, fear of missing out, and the Christian. So let us begin by defining what is this fear of missing out or FOMO. Uh, it was first introduced, uh, you'll, you'll see different ideas or dates about when it first became uh, defined, but uh, in my research, first introduced by a marketing strategist, no uh, big surprise there, a uh, marketing strategist named Dan Herman back in 2000, the year 2000, according to a Boston Magazine article written by a man named Ben Schreckinger. In that article, another gentleman who is an investment banker on Wall Street was quoted, uh, his name was Patrick McGinnis, and he was quoted talking about the fact that early on he and his friends started recognizing this phenomenon, and they actually uh, called it a fear, et phobo, fear of a better option. And w what he talks about in the article is that they were there in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working on their MBAs at Harvard, which immediately lends you to understand that these were not uh, po folks that we're talking about, okay? These were people who had means. And that in a post 9 11 world, when we had all sort of come to grips with our mortality, and the world as we knew it had changed when we were attacked in September of, of 2001, uh, that a lot of people were trying to live for the moment and cram everything they could into life. Uh, Patrick McGinnis is quoted as saying, all you wanted to do is live life to the fullest every second. Uh, McGinnis, who took his GMAT exam in New York, the uh, the day before 9-11, said you felt the need to do everything all the time because you had seen your own mortality. So this was one of the cultural phenomenon that took place in, in the early uh, part of this century when life sort of changed. And many of us, of course, we remember where we were at the time when that took place. Uh, he goes on to say, wherever you deposited yourself at any moment, you were setting yourself up for failure relatively speaking. Uh, he said that regardless of whatever decision they made to do one thing, they had this fear that they might have committed to one thing when something else better would come along. Fear of a better option. He said they weren't exactly sure what it was, but the unknown could be terrifying. Um, so it was fear of mi missing out is what the, the, the nomenclature eventually became, but it started out as fear of a better option. Uh, by 2004, the accepted label for this, what one author called the ailment of our cultural moment, was then entitled FOMO. Uh, in the dictionary, uh, Webster's defines fear of missing out as a uh, fear of not being included in something such as an interesting or enjoyable activity. And here's a key part of this that others are experiencing. So does it, if I don't get to do something, that's one thing, but if I don't get to do something or have something and then I see other people are getting to do or have this, 
this tends to create some kind of anxiety. There are actually two uh, types of fear of missing out that have emerged. The first one being social fear of missing out. A unique term introduced, this author says, in 2004 to describe a phenomenon observed on social networking sites. We don't even call them that anymore. We've lumped everything nowadays into what we call social media. Uh, FOMO includes two processes, and this is interesting. Firstly, the perception of missing out followed with a compulsive behavior to maintain the social connections. Uh, and of course, this in this day and time is heavily influenced by social networking, which we now call social media. Now, this is not a lesson against uh, social media. Like any other thing, uh, social media can be used for positive purposes. But I think with the, uh, the change in our culture as a result of uh, what happened in, in, in 9-11 at and then the advent of social media becoming something that is pervasive in our society, it is no secret that a lot of people are undergoing a lot of anxiety these days. And I wanted to ask the question of myself, why is that? Well, I think we can put those two things together and understand. I found this model here. I hope that you can read that or see that, uh, that shows this cycle that happens in one particular case uh, when we uh, suffer this fear of missing out. So we fear that we're missing out on something. So we go to social media to find out uh, what's going on so that we don't miss out. Then we see other people doing things that we're not doing, and then we have a fear that we're missing out. And you can see that this is an endless cycle that takes place. Uh, the other kind uh, or, or, or flavor of fear of missing out is consumer fear of missing out. Uh, when our spending decisions are driven by an anxiety that we must purchase an object or experience lest we miss out on what, again, others have enjoyed without us. Now, we all know that this is not a new thing, right? Uh, I was a marketing major in college. I've always been fascinated by advertising. We can see this, and, and just about every advertisement you see is trying to promote uh, us to believe that we need to have uh, this thing because we don't want to miss out. I found this uh, chart uh, that you can see was from a uh, website called advertisement.com, uh, seven great FOMO marketing tactics. People use this against us. They want us to consider that we are missing out on something so that we will make a purchase. And I think that we all have been guilty of this from time to time. 48% of millennials have spent money they didn't have to keep up with friends. 40% of people say yes to spending because they worry about being left out of future events. And 60% make purchases because of fear of missing out. Most of these taking place within 24 hours. Uh, so it's uh, compul com uh, impulse purchasing, uh, fear of missing out, all of this uh, comes together to make us do things that we don't really put a lot of thought into, uh, and, and that is uh, problematic. Um, FOMO marketing refers to messaging that appeals to consumers' uh, desire to latch on to every opportunity before it slips through their fingers. Now listen to these, I think there's some uh, spiritual applications to th some of these. In an article uh, called 10 Effective Fear of Missing Out Marketing Techniques, uh, to increase online sales, these are some of the ones that I, I wanted to highlight from that article. First of all, you have to set a strict time limit. Uh, you have, we've all seen this, right? If you purchase now, you'll get not only one, but two of these, you know, Ronco super things, right? So uh, for only five payments of $57.95, we've seen that. If you purchase now, you get this. Uh, or uh, you better purchase now because it's going to be gone. So there's a strict time limit set that tends to motivate us. Using social proof, uh, we see this as well. Here's what one person did when they bought this and their life has changed for the better. Uh, you see this in these commercials where uh, 
there's a gadget being sold and the person has such a hard time, you know, opening a bag of chips until they get this special thing that makes their life wonderful. Uh, social proof uh, is pervasive in advertising to, to move us and we don't want to miss out on having that better life. Uh, a bundle of products or services. Uh, not only will you get this one thing, but you get all of these other things that go with it that are going to help uh, you feel better. Uh, and then using clever messaging. Uh, and then finally, soliciting user-generated content. And this is new with the internet sales age where we see uh, people will put uh, reviews, right? And uh, this is how I use this, it was great. Uh, and of course, to, our, to their credit, many uh, uh, con uh, consumers will give both positive and negative reviews and most of the time, we are able to have access to both of those. Uh, but user-generated content uh, can tend to make us fear uh, missing out on something. But what's the danger here? And here's how I would sum this up. When irrational and unhealthy forces drive the decisions that we make regarding how we spend our time and our money, we need to be aware of the potential negative spiritual implications and consequences. This is uh, about how we enact our lives and what we are motivated by. Ephesians 5 verse 16, uh, Paul tells us to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We have resources that God allows us to have. Uh, one of those is time. Uh, and there's only so much of that. We understand that's the one thing that cannot be purchased or a thing that cannot be purchased. And then we have our material resources that God entrusts to us, and we need to be very careful about how those are utilized as well. And when our society is trying to motivate us in irrational ways to use those resources, we need to be very careful, and I believe that there are spiritual implications as well. Just a few more uh, quotes from some of the articles that I was able to access uh, in researching this. First one said that fear of missing out comes from unhappiness. This comes from a place when you have anxiety about what other people are doing or having uh, compared to yourself, this comes from a place of unhappiness. Secondly, jealousy is all the fun you think they had. Uh, Erica Young said that. Um, number three, it's good for Facebook. Fear of missing out is good for Facebook. It's good for haagen sales and bad for our happiness. And then finally, the problem is attention. What you attend drives your behavior. In other words, what you pay attention to will drive how we behave. So that which we uh, de dedicate ourselves to thinking about is what will drive our behavior. This came from an online article by Eric Barker from June of 2016. Um, but you know what? All of this is not a new idea. Although it has been defined and kind of packaged for our uh, generation and uh, it's in its context now, it is not a new idea. In the introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes, we, we read, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is, no, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Jesus knew this as well. Uh, Noah read for us this morning from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will put on about your body. Don't worry about these things. Jesus wants us to understand that we need to rely on God to fulfill our needs and take care of us, not material things. Scott, could I impose upon you to go and get me a napkin, please? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we need to rely on God to fulfill our needs and not uh, these material things. So this is not a new idea. Uh, let's look at some Bible victims of fear of missing out. And I fear that you are going to miss out being first to the restaurant today, but uh, we will forge ahead. Uh, first of all, a Bible 
uh, victim of fear of missing out? Well, you don't have to go very far into the scriptures to find one. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, that a tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband and ate. What happened here with the first man and the first woman ever on earth? Uh, well, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate that. Pardon me. What happened to the first man and woman on earth? Well, she fell victim to some clever messaging, didn't she? Uh, the serpent came, the devil in the form of the serpent came to her and uh, asked her, can you eat of all the trees here? And she said, well, we can, except for the one that's in the midst of the garden. God said, you shall not eat of it lest you die. And Satan then said, you will not surely die. Here's what's going on. God just doesn't want you to know some things. You need to take this and you need to eat it. And she looked at it and saw that it was uh, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Got a half truth there, the false advertising we might say. And she uh, was afraid of missing out on something that now she had been introduced to. I like to uh, think of this, I call it what I call the Jed Clampett complex. Y'all remember uh, Beverly Hillbillies? Uh, come and listen to my story about a man named, we're not going to sing that right now, but we all remember that show, and we had Jed Clampett who was a mountaineer, poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed, as the words of the song go. In the very first episode of that, uh, we know that Jed strikes oil on his property, and they come and they're, they're trying to convince him to sell that property so they can get the oil off of it, and that he needs to move his family to Beverly Hills, California. And in trying to convince him, uh, one of the per people who's convincing, I don't remember if it's Mr. Drysdale, but he says, he said, Jed, you live in a, uh, you live in a one-room cabin. You have a, 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 a potbelly stove that heats the cabin. You can see through the floor, the cracks in the floor to the ground. You have an outhouse out here. You're surrounded as far as you can see by woods. That's all that's here. Uh, and Jed thinks about that for a second. He says, you know, you're right. I'd be crazy to leave that. It's a matter of perspective. Adam and Eve, when they had not been presented this fruit as something that they needed to desire, uh, they were fine. They were living in the garden in paradise, but the clever messaging got to them. Again, you don't have to go very much further in the book of Genesis to find somebody else that was affected by this fear of missing out. Genesis 4, beginning in verse 1, Now Adam knew his wife, she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now listen to this. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. That's another, that's a biblical way of saying that he was upset, perhaps even that he was depressed. Um, why was he depressed? Because his offering wasn't accepted. Here's what God says. So the Lord said to him, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, listen to this, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Cain did not get, if you will, pardon the uh, modern expression, he didn't get the likes and shares he wanted from his offering, and he was upset about it. Uh, so it led him to confront his own brother and eventually kill him. Now, God gave him the, God gave him the answer of how to deal with this. If you do well, will you not be accepted? But he decided to go a different direction and lash out at somebody who had nothing to do 
with what he had done, uh, and the result, of course, was disastrous. Cain feared missing out on God's acceptance, but he wasn't willing to do what was necessary to gain that. Another uh, interesting victim of fear of missing out we find in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, if you want to turn there briefly, we're not going to read the whole account, but we will uh, skim through this. I love the story of Naaman, uh, and it begins in uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Now, here, here's why he was great and honorable in the eyes of his master. Because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. So, Naaman, the Bible tells us, was a mighty man of valor. He was well respected by the king of Syria. But because God had used him to give Syria a victory against God's people. God was using uh, an outside force to uh, uh, chastise his own people. Um, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So here's a man that is an important man. He's the leader of the king's army. Uh, he's a mighty man of valor. And he is inflicted with uh, a horrible disease that will begin to rot his flesh and cause him perhaps eventually even to die. And he needs to figure out a way to get rid of that. And we know the rest of the story here is that one of the servant girls that had come back from a conquest said, you know what, I know a prophet and if he were here, he could, cure, he could cure Naaman of that leprosy. So Naaman ends up going to Elijah and uh, has, and you can kind of envision him on the way in the, the pomp and circumstance surrounding this because of his importance. And uh, he goes there and he expects something to happen. He expects a big ceremony. He expects a lot of uh, uh, attention to be paid to him. Uh, we don't know exactly everything that he had in mind, but we do know this. When he goes there and Elijah sends somebody out to say, tell him to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. That's not good enough. He is very disappointed. Uh, what do you mean? He said, I expected he would come out and wave his arms and do something great. And by the way, the River Jordan? Are you kidding me? We've got rivers that just blow that away. Can I go dip in them? So he gets angry and he goes away. Uh, Naaman made some mistakes. Uh, first of all, he believed that he had created his own success. He didn't realize that um, God had helped him, or at least he didn't recognize that. He didn't realize that just because you're the commander of the army doesn't mean that you're the one that does all the fighting. There were other people that helped him along the way, and he wasn't grateful for that. He relied on his own expectations of how God should act. He thought he had the answer of how this all should take place, and isn't it ironic that he's the one doing the asking? Uh, third, he misunderstood authority and obedience, and this one's very important because uh, God was the one that could grant him healing from this horrible disease. So shouldn't we obey that authority uh, and respect it? And then finally, he thought he deserved a better experience than what was offered up to him when the uh, healing was first offered. Next, the rich young ruler of Mark 10, beginning in uh, verse 17. Now behold, one came to Jesus, said to him, Good teacher, what things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one, is, no one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus, summarizing the Ten Commandments here, says you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man says to him, all these I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. 
But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. You might say that his countenance fell too, or that he was depressed by that, for he had great possessions. Do you, the, every time I read this, the irony just kind of comes back that he is so sad because he has so much. That's what the Bible says. He is so sorrowful because he has so many things. He feared missing out on what that material wealth would bring him. And then we get even more, I say, uh, demented and diabolical here with the uh, national Israel here represented by the chief priests and the Pharisees from John 11, beginning in verse 45. Now this is immediately after, you will know already in your Bible, what happened in John 11 that was a major thing in the life of Jesus, one of the seven miracles that John uh, recounts for us in, in the Gospel of John, and that is the, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Okay? What a, what a story. Jesus says, Lazarus come forth. Lazarus comes forth from that tomb having been dead for four days, still wrapped in the grave clothes, and there is no denying what has just taken place. So in verse 45, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, listen to this, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. If we leave him alone and allow him to do the things that he's doing already, which we can't refute uh, a man coming out of the grave, that has to be from God. But if we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe him. And here's the rub. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The height of hypocrisy and corruption. When these people are saying, uh, we got to get rid of this guy or we're going to lose our political position. Skip down to verse 53 to see how, just bad, how bad this becomes. From that day on, they plotted to put him to death because they were fearing missing out on the comfortable life that they had created by perverting their position as the leader of God's people. From that day on, they plotted to put him to death. All of these were victims of fear of missing out on something. Adam and Eve, well, they should have trusted in God's instruction. Cain was given the answer to his problem. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Naaman eventually obeyed the simple commands that came to him through God's prophet, and we are thankful that he did. And after doing so, he proclaimed that God was the only God. Wouldn't we as well, having been healed from our leprosy, uh, rec recognize our mistakes of trying to uh, orchestrate how God is going to help us? Uh, eventually, Naaman got it right. The rich young ruler should have increased his faith and changed his priorities. And then finally, the chief priests and Pharisees should have understood, as Jesus told them, the weightier matters of the law and recognized him as the Messiah that they were waiting for. Another bit of irony in the way that national Israel treated our Lord and Savior. So all of these were looking for something better, uh, and they had a fear of missing out on something. So in the time that we have left this morning, let's talk about uh, some ways that we can conquer this fear of missing out uh, spiritually speaking, number one, we'll refer to John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I would categorize this as saying, number one, we have to have a belief in Jesus' ability to fulfill our lives. We have to have a belief that he can do what he says and be who he says he is. Uh, that if we surrender to that and have faith in it, that our lives will be fulfilled. 
Of course, we know that they're not always going to be easy and things aren't always going to be perfect. But ultimately speaking, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Number two, Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. I would categorize this as the perseverance of our service. Understanding the why behind what we do when we serve God. Uh, not, it's not for ourselves, but again, the ironic conclusion is that the more we work for God, the more we're benefited personally. But the why is because uh, of what we believe about him. And then number three, Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So I, I, I name this belief in the hope and the reward. Do we really believe that there's a home in heaven? Do we really believe, even though we can't really conceptualize how good it's going to be, do we really have a strong enough faith to believe that one day we're going to live in heaven with him? That's the hope. The Bible says he who promised is faithful. If he's given us that hope and we do what is necessary to, to, to claim that reward, uh, he is faithful to give it. So some verses and Bible ways to conquer this fear of missing out. The next point is one actually that I've read uh, about anxiety in general and fear of missing out as well in a secular format. And it's interesting that people come to what I think is a biblical, biblical and spiritual conclusion, and that has to do with gratitude. If you are feeling overstressed, anxious, uh, if you are, your countenance has fallen because you feel like you're being left out of something, uh, experts, so-called experts, and the expert, the Bible, I believe, supports the fact that one of the things that will help you with that is gratitude. If we are spending time concentrating on what we are thankful for and what we do have, the blessings that we do have, we will find a lot less mental energy being spent on worrying about what we don't have. And I believe that this is very true. Psalm 118, 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it every day that we have from God as a gift. Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is God's will that we understand gratitude is important regardless of our circumstance. And one that I left out, but I think is obvious here, is where Paul said, godliness with contentment is great gain. If we can figure out a way every day in our lives to strike that balance of being content and being godly at the same time, then we have gained all there is to gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. In conclusion this morning, we need to realize what we should actually fear missing out on. I know that's bad grammar, but uh, we should fear missing these things. We should fear missing the abundant life that Jesus tells us in John 10, 10 that he wants us to have. We should fear missing out on that. We should fear missing out on the freedom from the bondage of sin. If, if we're feeling bound, if we're feeling burdened, uh, and if, if sin has something to do with it, as God told Cain that it would, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. Then we need to understand the freedom that can come from uh, following after God and, and understand that, that we need to fear missing out on that. And then finally, of course, we need to fear missing out on eternal life for ourselves. So this fear of missing out, there's actually a positive aspect of it when we think about what we could lose eternally. 
Just for a second, I'd like to go back to some of those marketing concepts. There were three of them that I had an asterisk by. Number one, a lot of times when people are trying to sell us something, they put a strict time limit on You don't buy by this time, you're going to miss out. Well, there is no clever messaging in the gospel, okay? There are no secrets. God tells us what we need to do his will, be pleasing to him, and have salvation. But there is a time limit, that, and, and it's not a trick, okay? But the, the, the thing about that time limit is we don't know when that time expires. So there is no time like the present to get your life right before God. And that's not a high-pressure tactic or, again, clever messaging. It's just the truth. We don't know how much time we have to live. We don't know when Christ is going to return. The next one was advertising a bundle or of products and services. And this is where, just as a Christian, if you stop and count the blessings that come from knowing Christ, from a relationship with God, from being in his church, and all of the blessings that come from that with your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the fellowship, the interaction, the worship, uh, it is a bundle of services and products. Forgive the expression. And we need to understand those blessings and take advantage of them. And then finally, soliciting user-generated content. We should be talking about this as Christians. We should be wanting to tell other people about the blessings that we find in Christ, in his church. And certainly, I don't do enough of that, and I would say that we don't do enough of that. In conclusion this morning, are you grateful enough for the opportunity that God has given you to do something about it if that need exists? I assure you, there is no better option than being in the right relationship with God and finding those blessings and the peace that can come from that, and we should ever be continuing to grow and work on that. If you have need this morning, either to make corrections or to put on Christ in baptism, begin your walk with him, there is no time like the present. Please come as we stand and sing the song selected.